I'm Gail. Um, I now spend three months every year in Baton Rouge where my grandchildren live. So wonderful. So this this was familiar territory. Um, Whitney. Same. Whitney. Short for Whitney. Hello, Barbara. I'm a guest. Because I wanted to give you a Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Maybe you'll start coming regularly in the ministry. I'm Mike. Sally. Nancy. I'm Pat. Ben. Bill. Joan. Amy. Paul. Sarah. What's your dog's name, Sarah? Oh, sorry. The most important part Zelda. Zelda. <laughs> Most important, but you know, she's with us. Zelda just did the full line of your book. Sorry, she didn't read the book though. Yes. <laughs> and then most people don't, that's what happens. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It's just when I'm pretending that she's not the back. Susan's back there recording this for her. Okay. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Was I not supposed to do that? Don't look at the camera and don't wave at the person behind the camera. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I've known her for a long time. So, yeah, so. so then it's okay. You can cut that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Cherie. So, hi everybody. Hi. So this is a regular book. This is. Yes. And uh, and usually you read mystery. So I guess you started with uh, Pasadena. We did. Yeah. Yeah. But then you moved on to early. Um, well, I got Oregon because I like Pasadena so much, and um, I thought, you know, there's some suspense in it. It's a dystopian novel with suspense. Mm -hmm. Did that jive okay with you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Honestly, we, we really have no rules at all. Last month we met with a sci-fi group, so we were watching. Oh, that's great! So yes, the bridge. What was that? The bridge was too wild. Dark matter. Dark matter by Blake Crouch. And look at this movie. This John Scalzi's novel Lock In. Lock In. Dark matter. Yeah. Lock In is actually a classic kind of hard-boiled side of the eye mystery moves to the science fiction aspects because there's like a lot of people live and they, their bodies don't function but their minds don't so much. Yeah, it's much more like that. Exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah. Ah, we also read young adult stuff fairly often. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. really yeah. nice about this group. That's cool. Yeah, there's a lot of good uh, young adult YA, and there was like a little spate of, uh, of um, a, a young adult mystery, but there's a little spate of young adult noir. Uh, that's I'm just, I'm currently reading something, I don't remember the, the writer, it's The Long Take, it's, it is noir novel written in verse. Oh. So it's not rhyming, it's blank verse, but it's sort of fascinating, it paints a real portrait of Los Angeles where I live and San Francisco so far, I haven't finished the book, maybe I'll paint a portrait of something else, but it is sort of your typical uh, down on his heels, um, veteran after World War II, you know, finds himself drifting from city to city, unwilling or unable to, to go home. And uh, so it doesn't have like, you know, some of those detective elements of like a heist or a, a body or anything like that, but it has all of sort of the, the pain and remorse Mm -hmm. um, and and since that, uh, there's a great line, and there are a lot of great lines in the book. But one of them was, um, "We've won the war. We won the war, but we're living like we lost it." And mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah, so something to take a look at. I guess it was up for the. Uh, so it's, uh, it's out. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's been out for I think a year. It was up for the Man Booker Prize. Um, yeah. Enjoyable, but uh, well, um, it's funny that you guys read Orleans as a mystery club because um, when I was writing that book, my, my husband is good friends with a guy who um, uh, came up in old Hollywood, and he'll tell these stories, and he'll be like, "Oh, well, you know, Hitch used to always say," and you're like, "Hitch." Hitchcock, and it's not a quote from an article, it's something Hitchcock said to him. He was Sam Peckinpah's writing partner for a long time. And so, um, you know, he was like, oh, let me read, he's read a couple of my manuscripts, and uh, with Arlene's, probably the most frustrating thing he's ever said with all of the manuscripts he's read is, um, you know, you'll give him something that he's worked on for years, and it's like, this is the thing, and he'll go, that's all right, you don't know what it's about yet. <laughs> Oh, I know exactly what it is. <laughs> you didn't read all the words in a row. Or 
I didn't know what it was about, too. It was just a bad thing. And then you go home like, do I not know? And you try to dig a little deeper. But for Orleans, he said, um, you have to ask yourself, is this a thriller or is it a mystery? And I just, I didn't, I had not asked myself that. I was like, it is a book. I don't know. And, and um, he, and what it was, in the, in the, the earlier drafts, um, you did not know what Daniel was carrying. You didn't know what his name was. Because I was using him as just like, like let's get him in and it'll be revealed, you know? And like, you know, he's the MacGuffin. Yeah. yeah. And okay. somewhere, and he is and he isn't because it could have, yeah. like, at that time, it could have played into it in a different way. Yeah. I didn't know, I was still sort of. Um, you know, who knew what it could have been, but the way it started was like um, it was going to be, you know, the big musical sting when she realizes what is here, and you know, and we all realize that there's a big gasp, and everybody goes, Oh my god, let's make this a movie and give her money. And, <laughs> and, um, and he pointed out because it's speculative, and I read a lot of, I read and grew up on a lot of speculative fiction, but I have not written it yet. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, right? In, in a world that is not our own, there's a lot that you don't know. And so he thought he felt that to make, um, to add a mystery into a world that was already too mysterious for, you know, the mundane uh, reader to grasp was just like a bridge too far. It was going to be too complicated. And so he said, a mystery you don't know what's happening. A thriller you know exactly what's happening. You do not know if they'll succeed. And so much more of a ticking clock, and um, and that that was interesting. And so um, I was like, oh, I, I guess I guess it's a thriller. It's the one time I didn't know what this book was about. But my other book, I totally knew what it was about. So um, so it's interesting to have to have a group of mystery readers. Did, did you always have the Father John review? Because that, um, that was pretty pretty close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah I did because I knew she had somebody who she could go to for help, somebody that she thought would be um, useful. And you know, there's a, a bad mother and a bad father archetype in in the in the book, and um, and a. Oh, we've read it. Okay. Okay. Who has not read the book? I guess that's the easy. And we will not shame you and ring a bell. Right? <laughs> we're, we're still talking about our leads. Yes. Okay. Talking about our leads. Zelda shame. Zelda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not printed in dog yet. And when it is, <laughs> she will read it. Or maybe she reads German. I think she reads Braille. Braille. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to make dog books that were just um, scents, smells, and flavors? You know, they could yeah. a lick and yeah. learn. Well, one could make that a yeah. pure book. But no, you probably did. You probably did. Wow, this smells like we have kid books that are scratches. Right, like that. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Oh, I had a scratch that book that I, I it's like a drug. When I was little, I was a little kid. You know, there's a hot chocolate sticker that got rubbed completely. Yeah. Because it smelled so good. So that that would be neat for dogs. I wonder if dogs might like that. Um, <laughs> humans, humans would probably buy it at least once. Yeah. yeah. I would really, really like the rooftop scene. Oh, I'm very yeah. glad to see that thing disappear down into the puck somewhere. Oh, I don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah. That was pretty, very powerful, very well Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was creepy. Yeah, it was really, it was really good, good, creepy stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of good, creepy stuff. Well, you know what? When I, when I think maybe, like, I can talk about the book, but I, I think I kind of would like to hear you guys talk about the book the way you would if I was up here. And then, like, if you have questions, you know, I, I'm here. I can say that I loved the white flesh. I loved the, the lingo, and there was a bit of a mystery there, too. Right, trying to understand. Well, and it's, well, not even understanding, it's just where did it come from? Why is she speaking this way and her parents didn't? And, and then for it to become tribal, and, you know, and the tribes were divided by blood, and, you know, so, so there is revelation there, but the language um, is very consistent, I think, and very beautiful. I'm going to write a letter to my editor on that book because her voice came to me, and um, and and I just wrote it how I heard it, and then my editor was like, well, "What are the rules to her language?" 
I was like, the rules are she says it and I write it down, you know? Like, like, why are you gotta bind me down with rules and grammar? And I said it it feels right. So this is this is how it's going. And she um, because when you when you write a book, you work with your editor after you know, maybe after you have a draft or or twenty, you work with your editor to make it better and then they bring in a copy editor who is the giant red pencil it's just like ah, you know you called her mary here but her name was jane on this page and that place doesn't exist or you know like they go through and typos and everything else and logic questions and grammatical things and um she knew that the copy editor was just was going to formalize the language without my input, you know, like would go through and autocorrect everything basically. So we sat down and talked about it and and I think we ended that conversation with please leave me alone or you tell me what you want it to be and then I will tell you if that is wrong or okay with me. So she did. She was like, it seems like mostly this and this. And so every time she does this, you know, this corresponds, and this is how she'll use pronouns, this is how she'll use verb tenses, and and, um, and she gave me this little cheat sheet, and I hated it. It was like Latin, you know. I just it, suddenly it didn't feel like a like a living language to me, but I realized that nobody else could hear what I was hearing. And if that made it more intelligible for people, then that's what I would do. And so it's not really far off. There are just some times where it's like you meet, you don't meet people. I don't know why I was going to say you meet, you meet people who say the and thou, but you never meet people who say the and thou. But like you read things and sometimes it seems like the and thou, sometimes it seems like you and I, and there's not, they're not married to one or like sometimes you say y'all and sometimes you say you. And uh, so I felt like you could have that sort of leeway and she wanted it to be like always the same. And I'm glad she did because, well, you just complimented it. So that's awesome. But also I, I did, I've met some readers who, I met a woman who was just like, I wanted to read this book and I hit that language and just couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't do it, wouldn't do it, don't like things like that. And so she never read the book and then still felt the need to come to an event and let me know. Um, <laughs> and I was like, wow, ah, I feel like it's a real barrier to entry. It bothered you. And and so, so she's not a mystery club number one. Right. <laughs> so I just want, you know, I think knowing that it was at least standardized, you know, in its own uh, system, um, hopefully made it easier for people who might have had that, you know, I don't understand. I think if people don't. have a hard time with it, it's usually just that it's like a block I have right. for math. And then they're not yeah. going to even, yeah, they're not going to put in the work. Yeah. yeah. I haven't gotten a lot of complaints about it, but essentially, whereas other people like didn't even really notice it until, until like a different voice came in, until Daniel came in or something. And they're like, oh, right. So. Yeah, and Daniel's voice actually sounded much more removed. Yeah, well, Daniel's in a different tense. Yeah, I heard it. And that was delicious. Wow. That and he's you. always got the suit on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Your dead dead. yeah she always has first, a suit. Suit. Uh, So she's first person present tense, and my editor again. Why are you doing this? Because he's third person, sort of narrative past tense, and um, she's like, "Do you realize?" I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, because it feels right. Stop asking questions. But because um, in my mind, she lives in Orleans. It's life or death. It's an immediate world, an immediate experience. He he comes from a safer place where there is more uh, more time for reflection, more everything. You know, like it's he's just not living on the edge. And I had thought about the longer he was in. Orleans sort of speeding up and changing his his tense maybe, um, but decided that, that would be um, too confusing for, for the average reader. So, um, so we didn't do that. But yeah, so that was a conversation that went back and forth. And here you are, like immediately, like she lives in a different world. I'm like, thank you. Well, I'm just gonna send <laughs> that to my editor notice. today. Like I, it just seemed completely natural to me. I mean, it didn't make sense. Yeah, it mm -hmm. thank, thank you. It sounds like your editor is really involved. I hear a lot of authors dealing with agents first, more than editors. So, so the way it works is, uh, in most fiction these days, it didn't always used to be the case, in most fiction these days you need to have an agent. 
And the reason, one of the reasons is um, there's so many manuscripts out there mm -hmm. and only enough, you know, only a handful of gatekeepers who can read them all. So an agent um, sort of is the first filter of this book seems publishable. And then there are different types of agents. Some agents are really developmental and they want to dig in with you and help you craft this thing. And others are just like, great, let's try to sell it. And then um, with editors, it can be kind of the same too. Some that are really like, let's dig in. And some that are like, let's just, you know, type it up, <laughs> clean it up. You know, spell check once and go. And you've read those books, I'm sure, where you're like, did anybody look at this? <laughs> so, especially um, um, famous authors who are Oh, isn't that interesting? I think that there are. Um, I think there's Stephen King. I mean, I just like his editors are well, paying much attention. You make enough money, you bring enough name, they trust you to, like, well, nobody's complained yet. Go on ahead and do it. I asked a writer, China Mayville, who writes speculative fiction, weird fiction. I asked him, because um, I read books all the time where I'm like, my editor would never let me do that, you know? And uh, um, I said, how do, you, how do you get away with it? I didn't even say with what. I just said, how do you get away with it? And he had been walking away from me. He stopped and he looked back and he goes, I get away with it a lot. And walked away. <laughs> and for him, I think there's a perception. The guy's got like a, I don't know, PhD in economics. He looks like Mr. Clean with tattoos. He's a Marxist and he's got earrings. And like people just think he's cool and he's smart. And who am I to question? Who is this? China Mieville is his name. He writes speculative fiction. His first book was called King Rat, maybe 10, 12 years ago. But um, the next book, which was bigger, was called Perdido Street Station. Um, it's mm -hmm. all we care about. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, he's got a mystery, The City in the City. It's a police procedural set in a reality in which two, they seem like Eastern Bloc countries, are superimposed over each other. Hmm. So it's like an interdimensional, and so the, 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 the victim is from one dimension and the body's found in another, so it's a cross <laughs> department <laughs> procedural, and it's Sounds bizarre. Like it gets away with a lot. Yeah. It does, it gets away with a lot. And it's a bizarre but interesting book, because like, you, you can sometimes you can see people in the other city and you ignore them. That's the rule, is like you don't see it. So it's hard to find witnesses to a murder that happens. It sounds like you have a sort of an old time editor, whereas like current, you know, current editors are very uninvolved. You have to get your own editor, you have to get your own PR. Well, you still have to get your own PR and I'm gonna, and I'll counter that because um, it, de it does depend on the editor to editor is different, and I actually no longer have the editor who worked with me on Orleans. And uh, she worked with me on Orleans and the early passes of Pasadena. Um, and then she did what so many of my editors have done, she had a baby. She got married, had a baby, and then went to raise her kid and keeps trying to come back and then just keeps having babies. And I'm like, you can fix that really easily. <laughs> It, it hasn't happened, so. Oh, it was a surprise, Sheree. And I'm like, it's never a surprise. Um, so, there was only the one surprise. Right, right, right. right. The surprise is you haven't figured out the connection. But, um, so I have actually, um, I think my, like my first novel, Lucy the Giant, I had, I had three editors on it because there was someone who bought the manuscript. It was like, I want to make this, um, and then decided to go home and be a stay-at-home mom. And there was someone coming off of maternity leave who was like, I love this book too, I will be the editor. And the day the book came out, um, I, you know, it was my first book, and I'm like, oh, you do a thing, right? So I like, I flew to New York, and I had lunch with my editor, and we're sitting there, and there's this other woman at the table, and I'm like, Who's that? And she said, that's your new editor. I decided to go home and raise my child. So that's really true in, in kid lit, I think. That there are a lot of young, attractive women, many of them blonde. Um, they, she was not. She was the only brunette. But a lot of pretty blonde women who um, were um, have lots of things. No, you know, I, I don't, don't tell anybody I said this. I'm just going to say it. Is that, um, their publishing in Manhattan since the 50s has been like a finishing school. But, you know, like 
young women from well-to-do families go get their MRS degree. Um, and well, they, they have to. They have to be well to do. Yeah, you have to, you don't to get live paid. off of, to live off of what an editor makes. You do so, um, and then that's what happens. Is like they come and they, you know, Jackie Je- Je- Kennedy is probably the best example of it. You know, you you build up your ability to be a, a, a scintillating dinner party hostess, and and that's not true for all of them. There are some that are definitely in it as a career and this is what they want, but I feel like I've had both. I've had both, and I've come to tell them that if you are single, if you're dating but want to get married, edit me, because he's going to propose within six months of you agreeing to work on a book with me, and you will be married by the time the book comes out, you will have a baby by the time you try to start it, and they go, oh, that's not, that's not, we have got some news, and I'm like, I told you, I'm like a matchmaker, but it's so, um, so that can be a challenge. I did have one guy, uh, one one male editor, and that's who I worked with on Orleans for half of Orleans, um, and he had a very different idea of what the book should be, so it was probably uh, for the best that we stopped working together. But um, he actually got laid off. I've had two editors get laid off. Gosh, how many editors? I've probably had seven editors, and I've written nine books. Um, yeah, and he got downsized. Um, and then, um, and so his thing was, you guys have all read the book. When I started writing the book, I was trying to write it just from Ben's point of view. And then I was like, you know what, I'm going to do a bunch of points of view. Because like, I wanted to slip into heads and see the world from a bunch of different people's points of view, and he pulled out some book called Enchantress from the Stars. It was a kid's book that he had loved when he was a kid, and he goes, nope, it should be structured like this. And there were three voices, A, B, C. And uh, he's like, this is what you should do. And I was like, well, I've mostly got Fed and Daniel. I don't, you know, I have a C voice maybe, but I, but do I have, you know, okay, I'll try it. And uh, we had done Fly Girl together and Fly Girl went well, so I was like, okay, we'll try it. And the third character, because I do have more story for her, is Priscilla, who, um, the caretaker for the professors. And so I tried. I, I, you know, I gave her a full third of the book, and it wasn't working. She, she deserves part of the book, she doesn't deserve a third. She could probably have more than what she has currently, but not a third. And um, and he just couldn't hear that, and I didn't know what to do. And I went on a retreat um, and met a woman, another writer, Rana Reka Rizzuto, um, who's got a thriller of Shadow Child. And she said to me, oh, wonderful. And she teaches I got it too. And she said, um, do you want me to read the tarot cards for your book? Which no one has ever said to me in their life. So I was like, Sure, let's see what that's like. And she'd never read the book, but I guess she went back to her. We were at Hedgebrook, um, Hedgebrook which is a women's writing retreat um, on an island in Puget Sound. And we each have a little cottage in the woods, and she went back to her cottage the next day. She was like, okay, I read the cards, and she recreated the layout for me. And um, there was this crazy card that was like uh, a rock blocking the flow of a river and like a cave. And she's like, you know, it feels like there's like three things and one of them isn't working and it's blocking the creative flow of this story. Does that make sense to you? And I was like, yeah, it totally makes sense. It's Priscilla, she's the rock, we gotta take her. So I really trimmed her role back um, with the idea of saving her for another book. Because when I originally pitched this idea, I wanted it to be a trilogy. And they said, sure, nobody's doing trilogies. And they said, wow, you lied directly in my face. Everybody's doing trilogies. But they were uncomfortable with it, so they were like, let's see how the first book goes. So Priscilla's got a whole other life that is. So we may life. not have completely lost yet, Ben? Um, well, I, um, for all practical purposes, you have. Because um, as much as people seem to like that book, it didn't do the numbers that the publisher wanted. So I don't get to do a sequel. Or maybe one day when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm Stephen King, they'll, they'll say, whatever you want. And I'll go, I'm doing a sequel to Orleans. So just wait for the next editor. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, I try. It, it hasn't worked yet. 
I try. And they go, what are you thinking next? And I'm like, what? And they're like, no. So, because the numbers live forever. The editors come and go, publishers come and go, and the numbers. Do they have numbers on your audience, the um, demographics of your audience? No, I no, don't think no so. I, they, you know, the way the numbers that I get to see are basically just sales numbers, mm -hmm. and so that like I can go online and see how many copies of a book they shipped to booksellers, and then I can see. Um, how many copies actually sold because booksellers can return books and um, uh, and so you might think, oh my gosh, hooray! <laughs> I don't know, 10,000 copies, and then a year and a half later, the accounting shakes down, and it's like, you sold 2,000 copies, you are like, well, what happened to all the 10,000? So, um, but that's as, that's as uh, deep a level as I get. Mm -hmm. I could probably hire a marketing firm to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I could probably get, I can get numbers to say, like, this went to book clubs, like Scholastic, because it's kids' books, so Scholastic Book Club, or the Junior Library Guild, mm -hmm. so I know that those were for my institutions, um, but no, I, I, I don't get the uh, breakdown of, like, you know, female age, da 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 yeah. da upper middle class, or middle class. Yeah. It really yeah. seems so yeah. bad, so much of it you can have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Orleans was optioned as a movie um, by a fancy producer who brought in a fancy writer, the guy who wrote the screenplay for the book Thief, and um, they wrote up a, a treatment, which is, I don't know, it's like probably like a 20-page document, their version of the story, and it was interesting because it was not Orleans. Um, it felt more like Road Warrior, like there were cars, trucks, and like people, you know, tribes drove around, and, and I was like, but where's the gas? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not the world that this is. Um, but also, like, you want to make a movie? Uh, go ahead, because that'll only help with sales of the book, and then maybe help me write the other books. And so, um, unfortunately, they couldn't get it together. They didn't get enough interest in it, which I kind of believe is because what they created was derivative of other things rather than Orleans, but I don't know. Um, and at the time I had, my, at the time my agent was at a big agency that had, you know, so I had like my literary agent, I had a book to film agent who would try to sell it to the film industry, and I had a book to TV agent that would try to sell things to TV. And so they were like, oh, we're so sorry that didn't work out, but, you know, we've got a TV production company that's interested. So then they were in talks to make it a TV series, which I thought was a better idea because um, I, it's a really big world. You get the one story in it, but it, but like there's a lot of room to play, I think. So I was very excited about that, and um, and then there was a problem. There was some hitch. Like I had my the first person who represented my work was a manager, and not my current agent, and he was sort of new to things, and I guess had left a clause in the contract with the publisher that allowed them to keep some rights that. Um, that the production company wanted, and for some reason they didn't agree. And I don't know that that is actually what happened, but this was a story that was finally told me that um, couldn't come to an agreement. So there were three sets of lawyers in the room, and then and then silence. And then one day I was at a book event and I saw my book to TV person, and I said, "Hey, how's it going?" And she goes, "Yeah, too bad that didn't work out." And I said, "What? What?" what? <laughs> and. Um, she was like, yeah, and I said, well, we'll take it somewhere else then. And she said, nope, nobody will ever be interested ever again. And I was like, wow, oh, okay, you know, and then you wander the streets lonely while by a lit place. It was really, you know, because I had been excited and I felt like something was, and I had been told when something gets optioned to be made into TV or, or movie, it's like a very long bus ride. 
and you celebrate when you get that ticket. You celebrate when you get on the bus. You might get kicked off at any point before you get to the destination. So who knows? So I didn't really make it out of the station there. But um, did you find I, out why it was killed? Well, the, the story they gave me was that they couldn't come to an agreement to remove this clause. I have a new agent, and I said, get them to remove that clause so we have another shot. And there's a lot of... And it didn't make sense to me because if they had just... I don't know what the rights were for, but if they had removed it, then it would have helped book sales. Because it's not like the publisher was doing anything to promote the book any further anyway, so it would have only been lamb yam, as we call it in New Orleans, and and uh, gravy, as we call it everywhere else, I guess. And um, uh, so that was very frustrating. But flash forward now, countless number of years, because I don't feel like counting them, but many years forward, and um, you may or may not be aware that there's a big fight going on in Los Angeles right now, or in the entertainment industry. The Writers Guild of America that represents TV and screenwriters um, has asked the, the union, they're a union, they have asked all of the writers to fire their agents. The Association of Talent Agents has, since the 60s or 70s, I think it's since the 70s, been profiting off of their clients in a way that doesn't benefit their clients. An agent works for you. You say, I've got this piece of intellectual property, I've got this book, I've got this screenplay, I've got whatever, and they go out and broker a deal and they get paid 10% or 15% of whatever money is made. But what the big agencies are doing now is they're packaging things. And they're saying, well, we represent this writer, we represent this director, we represent this actor. We're gonna bundle this package and try to sell it. And then if we bundle the package and sell it to a studio to make it, then we get producing credit and we get a chunk, a bigger chunk of the pie. Which then means they're negotiating in their own interest. And so if the studio is like, I think we can make a deal, but your writer's asking for too much money, they'll go, well, we'll give them a little less. And so with me, when they said no one's ever going to want this project ever again, I realized only this year what that actually might have meant was we couldn't make a deal that made us enough money on it. We don't represent enough people in the mix to make this show, so we're never going to do anything with it. It's not the same thing as you'll never find another studio to want it. It's just it's not worth our time. So it's, been, it's an interesting time now because a lot of uh, writers are going around their agents and uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's too bad because you know, Fanny is such an incredible character. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she really, she deserves a wider audience, I think. Okay. Yeah, and I wanted to go back to, you know, I thought that, uh, you know, the two points of view, mm -hmm. that, that really added something to the book for me. I don't know what other people thought over there, mm -hmm. but um, it's just, it was like, you know, she was so intense, and then you go yeah. over to him. And so it was like, phew, I can, I can see the little bumbling breather. Yeah. 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 yeah, he was yeah. so yeah. lost. He was just lost until the end. Until the end, he was like, okay, I'm making the break. Yeah. But like, but it was like, normal yeah. person, would the average yeah. person fare any better? I get a lot of teenagers who are like, why is Daniel so dumb? And I'm like, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> what would you do? You don't know. You think you know, but yeah, you know. Yeah, no idea what he was doing. Yeah. No, he also, didn't, he didn't Daniel's so he dumb alive. because she says he's dumb. Yeah, she calls him dumb. Right. He's actually so, very so, smart in his way. Yeah, so it's like, is he really dumb? Yeah. No, it's because she's calling him dumb. And, and the she's way got it, an expectation. Well, she's street smart, and he's yeah. not. And he's not. Yeah, book smart, street smart. And she's also, right. what, 12, 15 years? Yeah. She's, she's 16. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he's probably so, it's interesting with, with that, because my editor, who wanted the three points of view, um, got laid off, and then I get a call from the publisher, and the, and the publisher, it's weird, because the publisher is your company, but it's also a person, the person who runs the imprint, and uh, my new publisher was like, she was a new hire, so it was a regime change, and she's like, I'm gonna be your editor. And uh, my one note for you is to undo everything he had you do. <laughs> Tell it from one point of view. And at this point, I'd already had the tarot cards read, and I was like, well, I can't. Because there's scenes in this book that you love that can't happen from Fen's point of view. The entire Superdome 
moment, which I love, is Daniel. It has to be Daniel or someone like Daniel, and I don't want to get rid of that. And her response was, we're sure you'll figure something out. <laughs> and so I stopped listening to them, and I just started redoing the story the way, you know, fixing the story to be what I thought it should be, which is ultimately what it is. Um, and it was in that process that my that, that publisher slash editor actually stopped being responsive to me. And um, and I said to my new agent, I said, you know, I'm not hearing from her, and I don't know why. And he goes, you know, I was talking to an assistant editor over there, and she's your editor. I don't know why you think the publisher is your editor. And I was like, because she called me and said, good news, I'm your editor. So I ended up with this other person who had been the assistant to the guy who'd gotten laid off, and she'd been bumped up to assistant editor. And she is the one that I finished the book with and did Pasadena with. I did Toymaker's Apprentice with her, and she is an amazing, she was amazing. And she's the one who, who wants to be in this as a career but keeps making people. So, um, I'm like, make books, not people. That's my new slogan. I'm going to march outside of that. Well, yeah. while she's home doing nothing. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It is a you nothing, right? Her yeah. Your editor. Well, and that's why I have thought about that. I've thought about that, but I have a new editor currently. Uh, because after her, she, she went on maternity leave, and I was given a young woman. Um, who was just supposed to be like with me till Pasadena came out, and then my editor was coming back. And um, I feel bad because I've now forced my editors to have family planning conversations <laughs> with me, and you're not allowed to do that. So I'm like, I'm not asking, I'm just asking. <laughs> um, how many kids do you want? And so she, um, she was supposed to come back. And so I had this young woman, and um, she was very new, very green, and then we found out that my editor wasn't coming back. And um, which she was afraid to tell me and had to like have someone else call me to say, she needs to tell you something, don't be bad. And I was like, I knew it, I could feel it. There was a shiver in the air. But um, <laughs> so then I had this young woman and we, um, she was very new. And then because she had me as an editor, her boyfriend proposed. <laughs> she got married and he got a job out of the city. And so she left the industry. And, I, and my current editor, who I've just uh, completed my next book with, um, we had a very awkward conversation where she's like, so your agent didn't want to say anything, but he said you're worried about, you know, people having babies. And I'm like, it's not a phobia. It's just, a, you know, it's business. It's business. And she's like, no, I'm in this for the long haul. And I really like her. And I think we've done good work together. And I would not insult our relationship by going outside to hire my old editor. You know, um, uh, I, I think that if I was writing something that wasn't her wheelhouse at all, um, um, or something they didn't want to publish, I might go back to my old editor and say, "Can I hire you on the side?" But I, I wouldn't. Um, I'm looking to build more new relationships. And really like yeah. So, what's your New Orleans connection? My New Orleans connection. So, um, if you look in the dedication to the book, it's dedicated to my mother, uh, John Marie Max Smith. Um, she was born and raised in New Orleans. I never lived there, but you know, we'd visit the grandparents in the summer. Um, loved the city. Um, I loved my mom. My mother was a Katrina survivor. So the book was actually actually came out of that experience. My mom had moved back down to New Orleans to take care of her parents um, until they passed away. And she was there trying to uh, renovate her house. She was remodeling the house so she could sell it and move out to California where my brother and I live. And um, when Katrina hit. And she tried to get a flight out, but they had closed the airport. She um, had a decision to make, like, do you drive out, maybe get stuck in your truck in the storm, or do you shelter in place? They had a house that was over 100 years old. It had been her parents' house, and it had never gotten any significant storm damage. So she decided to shelter in place. And um, the I was calling her throughout. Uh, I reached her during the eye of the storm, and she said that she'd been in her bedroom when she heard a sound like a truck hitting the house. Mm -hmm. And she jumped up out of bed and ran into the living room and the ceiling over her bed collapsed. And she was okay, but um, didn't know what was going on. And it's, you know, it's the middle of the night, all of this is happening. 
And so I said, you know, she was going to stay awake and I was going to call her as soon as the storm blew over because you lose the connection when the, the eye passes. And I called her the next day and it turned out that a neighboring building had like a structure around a big industrial air conditioner and one of the like, two by fours had blown off and pierced the roof of our house. And the rain came in and that made the drywall weak and collapsed the ceiling. But other than that, she was okay. It just, it was a bad storm, but it was just a storm. Uh, there were some trees down and that was it. And then it started trickling in that it was not just a storm. Because she said, call the insurance, she's like, I'm trying to call the insurance company, but um, they're not answering. So I tried calling the local company and then I tried the state company and then I went to the parent company before I could get anybody. And it became very clear that it wasn't just a hurricane. Uh, your average hurricane. She was on high ground. There was no flooding there, but um, she could not get out of the city. And she tried to drive out and got swamped in floodwaters. Somebody passing by in a swamp boat rescued her. Um, she had to walk um, a couple of miles to find a drugstore, um, which, of course, all the stores were closed, but looters had broken in and set up care stations where they were handing out water because they were refusing to let the Red Cross into the city because the powers that be had this great idea that they could get people to leave if they just smoked them out. If we don't help them, then they'll have to leave. Not stopping you to do the simple calculation that the people that are stuck there are elderly, disabled, poor, or stuck, just stuck. So I uh, was trying to figure out how to drive down to get her. I was gonna drive from LA to, to New Orleans to get her when reports came in that the police in the neighboring towns were blocking the entrances and shooting people. And all the law enforcement had fled in the city. So I told her, I'm listening to the news, mom, they're starting up a shelter at the Superdome, you should go there. And she said, I don't wanna go. And I said, why are you difficult? She said, because I'm your mother. And, um, and the next day, I heard reports that people were being assaulted in the Superdome, so thank God she didn't go. And one time, I'm like, thank you for not listening to me, Mom. And um, I did, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't get in from her. We couldn't get her out. And I just started calling, and eventually I called the, um, the Coast Guard. Hmm. I don't know why to this day. I'm not sure why, but I said, my mother was a diabetic. Her insulin was running out, it wasn't refrigerated. It was like a seven-year-old diabetic woman and she needs to get out. And the Coast Guard said, we'll go get her. And they sent an ambulance for her and they got her out and took her to a uh, convention center in downtown, got her on another bus that took her to the airport. The airport, they put her through these tents, through this processing thing and put her on an airplane. And then she landed somewhere and got on another bus and was taken to a stadium where the Red Cross had all these cots set up and, uh, and there were stations that you had to go to and she just said, I just want to get to, to California. I've got family waiting for me. And they gave her a gift card for $300 and said, just wait, we're going to finish processing you. And she's like, I don't want to wait. So she left. She's got like a, wa a couple of waterlogged suitcases and that big mom purse that moms have that have all her papers in it or whatever, um, just that had all been swollen and soaked in floodwaters. And she um, calls me and she's like, Sheree, I'm in a cab on the way to the airport. Um, I'm coming to you. And I said, mom, where are you? And uh, she said, hold on, cab driver, what city is this? because they'd never bothered to tell her what to take care of. She was in Charlotte. And uh, they said, oh, hold on. I might know, we might know people in Charlotte who can help you. And she said, no, I'm, I'm coming to you. And she got to the airport, and she went to United, which was her favorite airline, and said, I'm a Katrina evacuee, and I'm trying to get to Louisiana, I'm sorry, to California, LA, and all I have is, I have this gift card. And they said, oh, well, last minute ticket would be $100. And she's like, perhaps you didn't hear me. So she went down the road and got to US Airways, which no longer exists, but Charlotte was their hub. And they said, Miss Smith, how much do you have on that card? And she said, $300. And they said, we'll sell you a ticket for $250, so you have enough to get a cab. Mm -hmm. And that's how she got out to LA. And it was three more months before we could get back into the city. But in a, in a crisis, I do a lot of, uh, of news gathering and research, and I was reading articles about how the emergency response was terrible because uh, 
it was a predominantly African American city. If it had been a white city, that there would have been a bigger response. I read that uh, law enforcement had fled, but the street gangs were protecting their own neighborhoods. And I thought to myself, what if it wasn't about skin color, but something you couldn't see, like blood? And I thought, what if it wasn't gangs? What if it was tribes? And then one day after my mom had gotten out to LA, I was driving home, and uh, and I heard a voice in my head. Um, it said, oh, Nick Davis, you beautiful. Uh, greeny gray eyes like agate. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> Hello? Um, so I, I, you get used to this <laughs> as a writer. I called my office. I had a day job. I worked at a comic book company. I called my voicemail and just said, oh, Nick Davis, you beautiful. I don't know what it is, but. And, uh, and that's how the book started. Mm -hmm. and these stories show mm -hmm. the big stuff. Yeah, her voice was, that's why I said it felt right, like she was, that's how she was telling it, so that's how I was writing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So having my editor come and say, can you formalize this, felt like having someone come and say, you know you're speaking wrong. Mm -hmm. You know people who gently correct everything you mispronounce as you're talking, and you're like, so I decided to get a bow on you know, um, yeah, and then I had the learning from Yeah, I get it. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Your use of the institute, and uh, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about your about the institute, and then thinking about your use of the institute. Okay. Because it was it was it was Daniel's target, and that was going to be the answer, and that was. Going to and they were going to do great scientific stuff. But then when you got there, it was a bust. Yeah. It was a real bust. And, and, and it was a bust in terms of what they were doing, but it was also a bust in terms of what we thought they were doing. That's where I have some surprise. Okay. Okay. Um, you would think he would have been better informed. I think he would have been better informed, but there are a lot of... Um, so one of the things that I, I uh, sort of... I was reading the AC book. One of the things I was really um, playing with there was the uh, Tuskegee experiments, um, syphilis experiments on unwitting African American men, uh, and and how what we what the official line of what we're doing is what we're doing is good for humanity, but what's actually being done is not. And so Daniel from the outside only has sort of the company line, you know? This is what they were doing, this is what the headline said, this is what we were told they were doing, and you show up and discover that that's not the case. It's much, you know, I think it, 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 similar things happened in uh, um, Nazi Germany with Action T4, where they're, um, they're telling people that we've got, um, we've got care facilities for your mentally challenged children, send them to us, and oh, they died of a cold or something, when that's not, act, you know, they're testing out the final solution. So that's, that's what... Um, well, I think uh, I thought, and he thought, that it was a hard science, biological science. Because that. that makes sense, right? That right. they would be, and they're trying there, to solve... A bunch of social science people running around and, and, and not doing his work, not doing his kind of work. Not trying to solve or cure the right. fever, but, but think about this opportunity. You're building a quarantine space and now you can run social experiments in it. Hmm. And what I said before, if it's not about skin color, what is it about? It's human nature to divide. You know, it's sort of human nature to categorize, which leads to tribalizing. And so it's, it, it, it seemed to me, if you're a particularly heartless person, like a fantastic opportunity. It doesn't come along every day, you know, to be able to, to, to study this enclosed environment. And in theory, if, if you made discoveries, if it, if it worked out that you learned something about can we end racism, can we end hate, um, by you know focusing shifting our focus onto something else, um, it could you know uh, some horrific <laughs> things have been done with the greatest sort of uh, excuse of altruism in mind. Like what might that have done for humanity if they had made discoveries? But of course they succumbed to their own hubris. But also, I mean, secrecy um, yeah. breeds 
you know, corruption. Yeah. And there's there's the there's that wall, you know. So it's not like um, Orleans had a, a a media. Right. No, it's the ultimate secrecy. You can yeah. be doing whatever you want. Really, they could have been you know, openly experimenting on things or dressing up like puppies every night and having a party and, and you know, mm. only the only the military satellites would know. And it's also, it's a war zone, but it's only them, you know? Right. It's like the Northern America can look down and say, well, it's them. So well, they don't even the know border, Which is anymore. what we're doing now. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, so know, it's very current. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the book came out so many years ago. But yeah. but it it is the the We're the dead. idea that you um, they think it's all dead, right? Because you don't because you don't have any media. You don't you're not hearing anything anymore. And that disease was so terrible, nobody could have possibly survived it. You know, I wonder how many times we think that. Like, I always I always marvel when there's a famine somewhere. There's some areas of this world have been so famine stricken for so long. I'm, how is anybody still there? How is anybody still alive? But humanity adapts and we keep on ticking. And then there's still that sense of that's them. That's them. If there's it's a not distance. in our country, if it's right. not in our, you know. And we have our own problems. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hope you got a little bit of a sense just from seeing Daniel leave, leave the outer states that the outer states has its own problems. Mm -hmm. And so. Did you have a hard time writing? <clears throat> Um, for lack of any other term, dystopian uh, uh, story. Because, no. Because I, I, I was kind of worrying about you. I was thinking, my gosh, she's going back to the story and all these terrible things are happening. And there's no positive vision here. I, I was. Well, it's interesting because, first of all, I, there, there, there was a positive vision, but it was a trilogy. And so, <laughs> yeah. so it's interesting because I do get adults saying, oh, it's all so dark. And I'm like, it didn't have to be. But you're literally like, I'm afraid of the dark. And then said, please leave me in the dark. And I'm like, OK, that's what you get. Um, <laughs> and I do, I feel that the story ends with a certain amount of hope. But I do think yeah. that yeah. young adult literature in particular should end with some hope. But um, what was hard was all of the hurricane research, mm. all of the Katrina research and sort of reliving that. My mother. Yeah. Um, we got her back into New Orleans, and she um, remodeled her you know, home for a second time, and then she passed away. And I consider her one of the victims of the storm, even though that's not how they calculate these things. They really need to, because the stress it took her. She actually had to fly to Florida and sit in the front offices of the parent company of her insurance company to get the money that was due her in order to repair her house. So, um, uh, so that, that was hard. Um, uh, but it also made the book an imperative for me. Like, like New Orleans didn't even New Orleans was devastated and still wasn't even the worst of it, and um, is never going to be the same. I just felt like people need to remember. Mm. So there was it an article. Feels, it feels like it feels more current now than when you wrote yeah. it. I mean, the wall is so much more, yeah. you know, it's like, well, the you know, yeah. 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 And, and, the, and the, the rain and the rain and, and the, the number of hurricanes that have been since then. Mm -hmm. oh, well, it's funny. Yeah. I actually had to change some of the hurricane names because those hurricanes hit. Yeah. Like, as I was writing them, and I was like, <laughs> oh. Um, and the book was about to come out, and they were like, could you not? And I'm like, yeah, because I had been going off of, the, they have the list of hurricane names, so and then I decided to create names. So that's um, why you picked Jesus? We'll say that again? That's why you picked Jesus? Yes, I <laughs> picked Jesus because you can have fun with it, and, and, uh, and it's not on the list currently. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I did, I wondered about that and, and, and paid attention to that. The, but the, with the wall, it's funny because it is current now, but something that's always stuck with me, um, when I was a freshman, and college, everybody had to take Psych 101. And I don't think it was for our enrichment, it was because the psych majors needed guinea pigs. So you had to sit in Psych 101 and then you had to sign up to be a lab rat for a certain number of hours. Um, I've had cathodes on me. Um, and uh, one of the things in our textbook was about the Berlin Wall being a, um, a physical manifestation of schizophrenia in our society. Hmm. And that, that, you know, I mean, that kind of says it all. And so whenever I think of the wall, and so I happen to be 
the following year, I guess it was the following year, the wall came down. And I remember standing in front of the TV in my dorm room, sobbing. And uh, and that summer, I studied in Europe. And one of our one of the kids in my class, he um, he went to see Pink Floyd at the Wall. They played the Wall at the mm -hmm. Wall, and he brought back chunks of the Wall for mm -hmm. everybody. And it's always sort of stayed in my mind. So whenever I think about building like a really divisive wall, that's what it is. And I and so that's what I was thinking because the response to to um, to Hurricane Katrina was really fracturing in this country. I think that there was a real, there was a us and them showed up, but it were all us. So how does that work? And I can only imagine what that must have been like for Germany to one day be Germany and the other day, next day be something else. So um, yeah, to see it happening again on our own soil, I think it is an illness that is cyclical mm -hmm. and we have to be vigilant. Also, I don't think Germany has ever, I mean, even though they've recovered quite a bit, I don't think they ever really We still have scar tissue, right? It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't oh, yeah. matter. Big time. It's, it's going to take a long, long time before. And we don't have time because history repeats itself every 30 years. And they've got like huge white supremacist groups there. All over the place. I mean, honestly, yeah. we're, we, we're, we might be next. Mm -hmm. We might be, it's everybody gets a shot. I mean, the, in that, um, the long take book that I'm reading, um, they were talking about McCarthyism. There's a conversation with um, a Jewish German professor who he says, you know, we fought Hitler and then we created our own. Like, can't they see that? And so, you know, um, I'm not making any direct comparisons today, but it's something that I worry you can. about. Well, I mean, I, well, you know what? Everybody's got their, their um, everybody's got the thing that keeps them up at night. And it's not all the same. Um, some of it really is, but then what they think the cause or the solution is is not the not the same. So we all just want to be happy, free, fed, safe, loved. You know? Could I shift gears to Pasadena because I want to make sure we have say, some time yeah. to talk about this too? Um, you were talking about author control and decision making. Mm -hmm. Did you choose the cover? Oh no. So um, um, the way covers go. Um, sometimes they're just like, and here's your cover, and you're like, yay, or you're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So, um, like with Orleans, actually, they had a totally different cover that was like sort of this murky silhouette of a girl and a wrought iron fence with fleur de -lis tops and like a bloody darkness in a street. And then they were like, we think this is going to be a bigger book. We're redoing the cover. So they did that cover, which is a lot of movies and books have done a cover that is the same sort of style that's all based off of like a uh, Scottish romantic painter's painting. I can't remember. It's called The Wanderer. It's like that's totally a trilogy cover. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, there's that cover. But for Pasadena, they gave me, sometimes they'll say, what do you think, Nick? And, and sometimes I will have an idea and sometimes I don't, but I, I like to see what they come up with. They gave me three different versions. And um, one of them was predominantly black. Um, and I was like, that's going to that's gonna wear terribly in shipping for a hardcover, because <laughs> like, black always seems to get scuffed up. And I didn't really like it. It was like a strip of film uh, and negative image, negative image, and a positive image or something like that. And the other one was a play on that, and I didn't like that. But like, they showed me this one, and it was a no-brainer. I was like, well, this is it, and it's such a beautiful, sophisticated cover. And um, so all I had to do was say, yes, please, to this one. And there's a book blogger out there who puts herself, like, does photos of herself with covers. So she did a picture of herself where she's the torso to the legs on the cover. So she was, like, <laughs> swimming like this. It's really funny. She sent it to me on social media. This isn't a fair question, so you don't have to answer it if you okay. want to. Really, I'm caught. Fascinating. It's not going to be a fair question. <laughs> did you begin with the end in mind when you started that book? Did you begin with that ending? in mind when you started the book? For Pasadena. Yeah. No. Wonderful. Well, I loved it. Oh, thank you. I loved it. I, looked, I, I cruised through the book, and then I got to that ending. I went, man, that's a great ending. Wow, that's really something. Oh, good. But did okay. you start with it? No. So Pasadena was uh, a lunchtime project, I called it, because I was working on Orleans. I was working on other things. And what I did was I had a, a legal pad. And every day at lunch, I'd go to this place called Sharky's and order a tray of nachos. And I would write three pages longhand. And the story, the book came about because my husband is a big film noir fan. And we have a, a 
we don't have a family room like normal people. We have an Art Deco home theater and that he's built himself and uh, this giant screen. And one night he was in there watching um, a noir. And I sat with him for a little while and I said, huh, I wonder if I could write a noir. And he goes, you think? And I said, sure. <laughs> and I, I left and the next day he was like, the thing is, Shri, about a noir is there's no heroes. Everybody's damaged. You got to understand. I'm like, I went to film school. And, 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 <laughs> thank you uh, for clarifying. And um, so the book is dedicated to him. Um, but, uh, you know, so I thought, like, well, who are the most damaged people I knew? Most damaged place? High school. Most damaged people. And so uh, Maggie is a bit of an homage to someone. Um, is not her detail-wise but um, the penchant for drama. And um, so I knew who the dead girl was, and I knew who my protagonist was, and I knew I was writing at first person. So I just started writing, and every day I would look at that last sentence that I'd written and go, well, what would I do next? And that's how I got to the end of the book. So no, I didn't know that, I didn't know how it was going to end. Really? Yeah. So did you go back, having reached the end, and sort of plan things? So I finished the book, the end? Yeah. and it's 50 pages. And I said, this is perfect. <laughs> and I gave it to my friend who had read the tarot cards for Orleans. And I said, you want to read something perfect? <laughs> and she goes, but what is it? It's not a book. That's like not even really a novella. You can't publish this. And I said, shut up. It's perfect. <laughs> and then I begrudgingly went back and I added another 50 pages. And I was like, perfection. <laughs> and she was like, you know, Sheree, you got to stop with that. Because I, I never thought anything was perfect. But for some reason, I kept thinking that that was nailed it. And she was encouraged me to, to make it bigger. And I did. And still, it wasn't, it was you know, approaching 200 pages, which is still quite small for a novel. And um, and at this point, I was looking for a new agent because my because the Orleans uh, thing had happened. Um, because when Orleans came out, and or when Orleans was sold, and they said that it was only going to be one book, I then was reading in the trades. Somebody had a similar sounding title that they just sold as a trilogy. And I got angry at my manager and was like, you're not doing your job. So um, I had outgrown him. And I was looking for a new agent, and a friend of mine recommended hers. And I gave her something, one of my unpublished novel, which is a mystery, actually. That's the one mystery I felt like I had written. And uh, Imagine he your surprise. bizarrely said to me, he said, well, he said, um, it's too commercial. Do you have anything more literary? And I was like, no agent in the history of the world has ever said something with two. This might make money. No. Yeah, that sounds um, like a right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But um, I said, well, I've got this thing. It's called Pasadena, and it's not done. And it's, I don't know what it is. It's too short to be a book. But um, sure. And I sent it to him, and he was like, oh, I love it. It's evocative. It's, he goes, the mystery is, well, you know. But I really, you know, the language. And so I was like, OK, I'll take that. Like, right? It was like, he, it, it sounded like 50-50. And he signed me, and so that was our first book together. Um, so yes, I was encouraged again. You know, I got my editor who was just like, "Okay, let's let's um, fill in some of the gaps," and and so that's what I did. So how do you get? Um, I mean, I know a lot of literary writers who can't get audio. Mm -hmm. And and they keep saying to me, oh well, my publisher never went there, and I'm like, because you have to go to them and say, I want audio, because I've had a couple of friends who've done that. Yeah. So why are I mean, you're I've available. had friends who've done that and been told no. I didn't bother. Um, but you're and, out there. Well, so what happened was I was sitting at home one day and I got an email saying, hey, good news, Pasadena is going to be an audio book, and I said, what? Okay. Um, can I, can, that's so exciting, can I come to the taping, can I, and they're like, and oh, it'll probably be in New York, and I'm like, I don't care, I'll go, because that's cool, and I need something on my blog, and I could blog about it, let me come, and they said they'd let me know, and then one day a box of tape showed up, uh, and, uh, and then CDs, and I was like, what about that, and they're like, oh yeah, sorry, and I was like, that's okay, because here it is in the flesh, and I, um, I called my husband into my office, and I popped it into the CD player, and they start up and it says, 
uh, Pasadena by Sherry L. Smith, oh, oh. dedicated to Kelvin. And my husband starts to laugh <laughs> so hard because I go, no, because I've got my name wrong and they got his weird name right. <laughs> and he's just like, that is rich. And I'm just like, shut up, get out of here. <laughs> so I um, called them, you know, and I'm like, dude, Cherie. And my editor was like, oh my god, they never asked me, and the people were so embarrassed, and of course they've printed all these CDs, and they're like, we can change it on the Audible download, but we can't change it on this first batch of printed ones, so we're so sorry. And I was like, that, okay. It That's is what amazing it is. that they didn't ask. No, they didn't, so yeah. then. But, um, I get the good news. Yeah. There's more. There's how always is, more. How was the reading? Did you like the reading? I did not like it at first, because it's noir, and it's meant to be deadpan. Yeah. So you've all read it, so I can use the language, but that opening line, Maggie always was a fucking train wreck. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great first line. So thank you. And I had to fight for that. I had to fight for that F-bomb there. And um, and I did, and I won, and there it is. But the audio book, she goes, Maggie always was a fucking train wreck. And it's like, <laughs> Valley Girl, angry much. And it made me, I was like, no. And she seemed to realize as she was going on that that was not the tone. And so it shifts, it improves. She makes Joey sounds like a like a puppy come to love. Hey, hey, I'm Joe. And 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 I and I was like, ah, oh, she makes all the boys sound sort of dumb. Um, What's the company that does it? I don't know because they they're different uh, audio companies that contract some are good them. and some. But suck. the reader, the, the but but what it really is, I think, yes, it could be directed differently. But they don't ask for any information. That's why I would have loved to have been in the room. Yeah. But they, that's probably why they don't have us in the room. Because I'd be like, could you do it again? But like, <laughs> but so you might, you might have corrected your name. I could have at least done that. <laughs> so but she. It's so important. Uh, to who? <laughs> Just to me and my mom, you know. Like, <laughs> so, I appreciate that. But so, so, um, but she does. It ultimately it was really compelling to listen to. I was surprised. I was like, I'm really enjoying this. She does great, softly accented Korean and Chinese. Like, just really nice job there. And then I get an email. Good news. We're turning Fly Girl into an audio book. And Fly Girl has been out for years, but it's my best-selling book. And I was like, well, that's exciting. And there. They're like, and we've got this woman, Bonnie Turpin, who has done a lot of big books, and she's a great voice actress. And so I went on to Twitter and was like, Bonnie Turpin, you're doing my book, and I'm so excited. And my Twitter page, it says, uh, Cherie rhymes with Capri. And she wrote back, I wish I'd known that's how your name was pronounced. Oh, no. And oh, we just did all no. the fixes. <laughs> so oh, I'm no. sorry. But I think it was a different production company and oh. didn't get the memo apparently. And so, so yeah. So if you you know collector's oh, item, if you want to go out there and buy the uh, the first CD pack, you can have my name. As well, when it goes on to talking books, they have the ability to edit. Well, and that should be corrected. But you know, if yeah. it's if it's something that's a download, it should be corrected. But yeah. but uh, yeah. So that's life. So I wanted to say that one of the things I loved about Pasadena was like the, the visualness of the entire thing. Mm. You really didn't need to say that you were a film noir fan. Right, your right. Your husband was and goes, oh my god, there's so many tributes in there. Yeah. Like, like the one-piece black swimsuit, the cigarettes, the sunglasses, the floating in the pool. You know, the, I, the one really funny line about, well, nobody went out until the pool guy showed up. Right. Actually. <laughs> yes, at least until the pool guy showed up. Yeah. Yeah, the, that is a book that I could just see. You know, and so I was just, like I said, I was just sort of narrating it. I knew the tone that I was going for and just like went for it and didn't pull back from cliches. And um, I really enjoyed writing it. And I enjoyed um, sort of writing a, a, a love letter to Pasadena. I had gone to Pasadena um, when my husband turned 40. For his birthday, we had a big party, and I had these little miniature these sculptures made of him, like a cartoon version of him, um, to give his gifts because everybody wants a small version of my husband. And um, <laughs> and the guy who was making them lived in a pool house in Pasadena, okay. and um, he was supposed to paint them in full color and had run out of time. And I said, "Can you just do a matte black finish like the Maltese Falcon?" 
because my husband likes that movie. And he was like, yeah, I could do that. So it's the Maltese Kelvin. And, and I had gone to him to like see the first Maltese Kelvin. And I'm driving up his road, and it's like it's the road. It inspired the road that Maggie's parents live on, because it had the tall um, palm trees and these beautiful old houses that have seen better days. And you could just see the curtains twitching back and like probably some toothless starlet, you know, who's like now an old crotchety lady, like looking at, it was, and I, I pulled up and I, I got to his face and it took him a little while to answer the door and I was getting creeped out. And I said, when he answered the door, I said, this is creepy. This is like Southern Gothic creepy. He's like, I know. <laughs> it weird? And, and so that always, that just stuck with me because Pasadena is such a beautiful city, but it is a Southern city in a lot of ways. They have the Rose Parade, so they have debutante ball. Um, and the Tournament of Roses, all those young ladies up on that are, are debutantes, and it's just fascinating. So it occurred to me after yes. I finished reading Pasadena, because I read Orleans first, that they're totally different books, and yet there's, there's always a woman who is kind of giving up something, or giving up her life for the greater good. So in Orleans, Fenn, you don't really know whether Fenn's alive or not at the end. He hopes that she is. But she's taking one for the, for the, the great good. Yeah. And then Maggie decides she's going to give it up so that her brother yeah. has a chance. Yeah. That's interesting. It's always nice to find out what you've done when you talk to people. Like, somebody once said that, you, you, um, that your characters are like an acting troupe. They show up in every book, but they have different names, different costumes, and everything. But that's the story that you're always going to tell. That every writer has that one story that they tell over and over again. So that that's interesting, particularly because like, and I don't equate the two at all. Because Maggie could have just been a dastardly person, you know, um, but she was a contradiction. She was meant to be a contradiction. Um, Fen is really my mom. Is. Finn and Lydia. Yeah, she was Finn and Lydia combined. And so it was sort of interesting to, to splinter the two because my mom was a lady. She was intelligent, well-educated, um, just um, a powerhouse, an amazing woman. Um, but one day she said to me, I wrote a short story about this, one day um, something, we're talking about something, and she goes, oh, it reminds me of when that girl went after my teacher was a knife. and." in elementary school and I stood up and smacked it out of her hand. And I was like, you were in a knife fight in grade school? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And she was like, oh yeah, she pulled a knife on the teacher and I got up and knocked it away and, and um, she said she was gonna get me after school and I was like, what'd you do? She said, I left school early and ran home. <laughs> and she said, I was like, wow, you were a badass for like five minutes in that story. You were incredible. And then you were realistic. But, um, so I wanted, you know, Finn to have that sort of toughness too. Mm. But with Maggie, yeah, I think it was the contradiction and, uh, and I like the idea of, and this is something actually that happened after, after my mom died. Um, she died suddenly. We had to do a quick funeral. Um, the rules in New Orleans are all based off of malaria laws from way back when. And um, uh, my brother and I were trying to plan a funeral like in a day. And, um, and it was this weird conversation of, he was, on, he was there, he had flown there, and I was gathering things in the city, in, in, in LA, and he was like, I'm looking at three coffins, and there's one that is cherry wood and one that's mahogany, and I'm like, and, and I said, oh, well, the cherry says, and he goes, oh, she hated cherry wood. Like, first of all, who hates cherry wood? And how do you know that? Like, what conversation did you have with her that told you that? And then he's like, oh, and then there's this one, it's got this sculpture, it's like a woman holding a guy, and I'm like, it's the Pieta, that was, she loved that sculpture. And he's like, why do you know that? Because like, I went to Italy and saw it and came back and told her about it as if I had invented it. And she's like, Sheree, I know what the piano is. I, 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 I took it as a child and you don't remember it. Yes, I love it. So that, and so just, I, it made me realize, like, we only know the version of the person that we know. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, only that was after the their Yeah, really gone. good part of that book. Yeah. Was everybody had a different take on Megan. Yeah. And yeah. it lets you know how complex mm -hmm. we are as human yeah. beings. He yeah. must have done a lot of eavesdropping because there's so many great lines, you know, these funny lines about, you know, place 
in there, you know, that you may, as you were writing the book, I was wondering where you heard all that. There were so many nice turns of phrase. You know, <laughs> I have no idea. The writer's mind is like a Hoover, you know, you just you suck it all up and it shows up one day when you dump the bag out. I don't know. It's just, some of it just comes into your head, some of it you do over here. Um, yeah, if you gave me a specific line, I could try to tell you, but honestly. Park and just, ride. What? Sorry? Park and ride. Park and ride. That just showed up. Yeah, that okay. just showed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because both books have a really, really strong sense of place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the places are, ca I mean, and they're named yeah. for the places. Yeah. And it's like the places are characters. Yeah. And they reflect the story. But it's a strength of yours as a writer, I think. Thank you. I don't know about your other books, but certainly in these two. Uh, you know, for these, it was specific, it was very deliberate, but I do like to, um, why not use your setting? You yeah, know? I And agree. it's so evocative, mm -hmm. and, and if you've been there, or even if you haven't, like, what, so yeah, Place has always been my first book set in Alaska, and, uh, and in fact, one of my notes, I got very few notes on that book, but the first note was, more Alaska, please. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, and I had already done, like, a, wait, I'm not writing Alaska, I'm writing a story that can happen anywhere, so let's make this Alaska, and changed a lot in order to do that, and then they still wanted even more, so yeah, I try, I try to, I like to travel, and, yeah. um, and a lot of people can't, so you might as well bring it to them. Yeah. What was the title of the book that's set in Alaska? Lucy the Giant. Okay. Yeah. What's that about? Lucy the Giant is about a girl who is nicknamed the Giant because she is big, is a really big man. You know, she's like 6'4", and she comes from a broken home in Sitka, Alaska, and uh, when uh, things get to be too much. She is always being mistaken for an adult, so she impersonates an adult and gets a job on a crabbing vessel in the Bering Sea, which now we all know is the deadliest catch and the most dangerous <laughs> job in the world. And uh, and here she is, this teenage girl, pretending to be an adult and doing it. So um, yeah, I had, that was so my first novel. I, I used to be a, a development executive at Disney for TV animation, we come up with ideas for animated sequels to all their big uh, animated movies. And I was visiting a writer that we worked with in Alaska. He kept saying, come on up. And the minute I got there, he was like, go and see things and don't be here. <laughs> Sit me away again. But um, I traveled around a little bit in southeastern Alaska. And, um, he had another guest with him, and she took me to um, this to the University of Alaska. I had a totem pole, and we're standing under the totem pole, and she's telling me about this group of kids she used to teach at this like school for like wards of the state, and um, and she said, oh, and then there was Lucy, Lucy the giant, and I heard gong. I said, what did you say? And she said, Lucy the giant gong, and I'm like, what did you say? and I didn't know what was happening, uh -huh. and I was like, okay, and and that was a girl who was heavy set. And she told me about her, and I ended up writing it down, and I was writing notes, and I was on the Alaskan Marine Highway, it's these ferries that take you from town to town, sitting in the cafeteria, and this um, Canadian family was eyeballing me from another booth, and I was like, what are they doing? Because I'm a city girl, and I'm suspicious of everybody. And, um, and the mother comes over to me, and she goes, excuse me, are you a writer? And I said, no. <laughs> and she, uh, she looks at my legal pad and goes, but you're writing. <laughs> your logic is astounding. <laughs> no, and you know she was my angel, like yeah. coming over to say, "I think yeah. you are." And I, I realized later on that that was I was writing notes for my first book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that actually Pat and I were talking about at dinner, um, we have another book group. And we've read, a whole lot of, <laughs> we've read a lot of books where the environment mm -hmm. and problems in the environment are primary. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels like you're being lectured to. Right. And mm -hmm. I really appreciated the environmental um, parts of your book, which spoke to or problems, but weren't in your face lecturing the fires in, Ca in Pasadena and the the New Orleans, the hurricanes and the way the landscape had changed. 
So well, I, I really like that. that. That's actually yeah. another great line. Is this is something so funny? Let's go watch some yeah. Let's go watch. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 What was the line? Oh, this, is, this is Southern California. Let's go watch something burn. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, when I first moved to LA. There was like a big, there was a huge fire in Malibu, and and yeah, my brother and I were like, my brother and I were roommates, and and uh, we were like, you want to go see the fire? So, um, in Santa Monica, which is on the coast, and then it curves out to Malibu. Um, there's a place, a place called Pacific Palisades, but there's like a a cliff and a railing and like a little pathway and it was like a Godzilla movie we were all these people were all lined up just watching the ridge of flame and uh, and I was like wow this is what people do in LA it's, it's weird you know because there's the I'm looking because I'm afraid it's coming towards my house and then there's the just like let's go see and that's a Vermont thing too um, yeah my parents um, lived in the same house for about 50 years and the house up the road from them on the dirt road, you know what that is, caught fire. Ah. And they saw the fire trucks go by. And they were like, well, all right. <laughs> so they got in the pickup and they drove up there. They, they just yeah. took chairs out of the back of the pickup, sat there, watched your <laughs> I mean, you don't really see There's not that much to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see a fire. So yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. See the fire. That's, yeah. that's why I left California. I'm like, fire season turned into 365 days. Yeah. Well, and it is really, really brutal right now. Yeah. It's, it's, I've been thinking Five about years writing, of drought, and I left, and then it started book. raining. Oh, right, right. El Nino comes by once in a while to make things better, and then, yeah, I've been thinking about writing fire, because the Paradise Fire this, this past year was yeah. so devastating. Yeah. And if you're going to write climate fiction, or climate eye, as they call it, like, to to be able to um, you got to cover all your bases. You, know? right. you guys have this the the snow that's you know the, the snow of the fire debris. That oh, we get ash. ash. You get where, ash. Yeah. Where everything. I mean, I was in Santa Barbara, so you, okay. you go out and like all the cars are just covered. covered. Oh, it's covered in LA too. And I uh, got married in Ojai. Oh. Uh, which is oh, halfway right between right. uh, Santa yeah. Barbara and LA, and um, and there was a huge wildfire coming towards Ojai, <laughs> and um, so our last wedding picture is if you look up there that the oh when you were getting married it was coming when up. we were getting married so that that poster for the stars are fire the Anita Shreve our last wedding picture is like a blood red sky with a palm tree, <laughs> and there was um, ash in the street swirling like snow when we went to dinner. Yeah, because my brother, the last thing he said to me at like the brunch the next day was, you need to lead your mother away from the fire because everybody was driving home. And we had to have a friend. I was like, I just got married. I'm not leaving yet. We had to have a friend like make sure she got out. Everybody got out safe. Crazy. Wow. And we went to Hawaii and watched that fire on the news for the entire honeymoon. It burned for Mm -hmm. like a good long three time. or four weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could have saved so much money just by taking the pickup and pulling out the chairs. Right, right. <laughs> like the entertainment for this wedding is a fire. Let's go look. Marshmallows for everyone. <laughs> yeah. So I have an off off the subject um, Do it. question. <laughs> in in the in the end and in you know your whatever the credits. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you thank Claire Detterer. How do you know Claire Ditterer? Claire and I were at Hedgebrook, that women's writing oh. retreat together, and okay. I was, is that in Pasadena? Or is that in Orleans? I don't what, remember. Oh, what, uh, yeah, Orleans. It's in Orleans. Okay, I couldn't, so I've been to Hedgebrook a few times, and, and both, I, I wrote the first draft of Orleans there, okay. and I wrote the, you know, the additional 50 pages of Pasadena there. Yeah. But um, uh, she was there working on Poser, my life in 23 Which yoga poses, first one, you know, her first book, and and uh, she saw, she found me sitting in the woods on a rock, and she she was new, and like as people come and go, and I was sitting there, and I looked up, and I and I saw her, but didn't say anything, and she walked towards me like, huh? and then she walked away, and kept going. And at dinner, she was like, I was going to introduce myself, but I could see the deadline in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so we became There's friends. There's a good line. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that is what that was. It was like seeing without seeing. And um, yeah, she's great. She's really great. And uh, we helped each other like just work out story stuff. So yeah. 
Okay. Thank you so much. I for want to do two things before we clap in the room.